Good morning, and welcome to Lakeshore Baptist Church. We are a welcoming and affirming community of Christians attempting to discover, articulate, and embody the meaning of the gospel in the world today. For everyone who is told the gospel isn't theirs, we welcome you and remind you that you are a glorious creation, so loved by the Creator exactly the way you are. We welcome all at Lakeshore because we believe that God's love knows no bounds. I've been asked to share a little bit about why I give to the church and find it important to give. Lakeshore, like everything else in the world, isn't perfect, and it doesn't claim to be. But what it is is a sanctuary to someone like me who, for most of their life, was told I wasn't welcome. I believe Lakeshore is a church that wants to be a place people can feel safe to talk about their doubts, fears, sexuality, gender, past traumas, current pains and anxieties, and are humble enough to admit when we are wrong. A place to listen for the divine voice and the gentle, bold, courageous acts of generosity, mutual respect, and kindness. I give because I believe we are a congregation committed to hope, a hope that cries out for freedom for the oppressed and compassion for the suffering. I hope that believes in our power to change and forgiveness through reconciliation. I give so that others like me always have a place to call home. Please join me in the litany of dedication. We praise you, O oh God, our Redeemer and Creator. We bring and our gifts in grateful Lord. devotion to you. All good things come from you, O oh God, and with gratitude we return to you what is yours. And so, in gratitude for all your gifts, we offer you ourselves and all that we have. Therefore, Lord, receive these offerings. Transform them into a source of life for many. Okay, uh, at this time, we're going to call the church into a business, very brief business meeting to vote on the proposed budget for 2021. Uh, and there's, uh, we've already had discussion on Wednesday night at the prior business meeting, so there is no discussion of this. It's just a, a vote to approve or to reject the proposed 2021 budget. So I'm calling the church into session for that purpose only. Um, if you could please, if you could please, uh, click, if you haven't already done so, please, uh, change your video so that I can see you briefly, uh, unless you don't want to, <laughs> if you're in your PJ still, um, so that I'm going to ask everybody who is in favor of approving the proposed 2021 budget, if you could please just hold your hand up like this in front of the screen at this time. And I'm going to look through everybody's lovely faces, uh, and pictures. Okay, and um, if any of you are uh, not in favor of approving the 2021 proposed budget, please at this time, raise your hand and I'll click through. Okay, great. I see no opposition, uh, it's unanimous and the budget for 2021 is approved and we are adjourned, thank you. As we have committed ourselves, dedicated our giving, our gifts, our time. We have made this vote and in that vote, we have said, yes, we will move forward with our choice to help make the church continue to be a place that like Charlie said, is here to be a safe haven for all. And now welcome us into our, the rest of our service through the passing of the peace. So at this point, I do invite all for the cacophony of lovely noise to pass the peace with us. May the peace of Christ be always with you. And also and with you. And also be with you. Christ, 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 Christ,
Yeah. 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 Okay. Here now, a letter from, or part of Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now the God who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through this use your generosity and that will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ, and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you, because of your surpassing grace, because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In response to that, we join in song together, although we long to be together and hear one another's voices right now. You are hearing the voice of only me and those in your space with you. Uh, but join with me in this verse. Treasure to you have entrusted, gain through powers your grace conferred. Ours to use for home and kindred, and to spread the gospel word. Open wide our hands in sharing as we heed Christ's ageless call. Healing, teaching, and reclaiming, serving you by loving all. May we pray together. Oh God, how do we begin this prayer on this Sunday before Thanksgiving in this year like no other? We begin by saying thank you. Thank you, God, for the things that ground us in your faithfulness. For the things that have sustained us every day of our lives. for the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies, for the sun that comes up every morning, for the moon and stars that shine your glory at night, for the earth that turns from light to dark and light again, for the rain that falls on the earth that gives us good food. For the tree we can see from our window that shines a burst of color just as we knew it would this time of year. For the beat of our hearts that carry us through life on this earth, day by day, year by year. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God, and your steadfast love. Morning by morning, new mercies we see. Thank you, God, for those who bring bread 
and kindness to our door. For friends on earth and friends above. For family members we love and who love us. For a familiar voice on the phone, just calling to check in, just calling to say I love you. For your tender strength, O oh God, that carries us across every threshold of life. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness that gives us more mercies every morning, every night. For music that soothes and heals. For songs that lift our spirits. For walks that carry us through the beauty of the seasons. For the memories that help us tell the stories of our lives. For your loving presence. Blessing us at every meal. For each good night's sleep that calms our bodies and minds and help us, helps us begin again. For all these sacred signs of your daily love and care for us. Thank you, loving God. Thank you, God, for our tears, sometimes when we least expect them, for they speak to the depths of our feelings when we cannot find the words. Thank you, God, that we are part of a web of needs and generous gifts that have helped us walk the miles this year and bear loads we could not have carried alone. Thank you for our relationship with you through the spirit of prayer. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God, and your steadfast love. In the name of you, our creator, our redeemer, and the spirit of love. Amen. The Gospel reading this morning is from the Gospel according to Luke, the 12th chapter, verses 13 to 21. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, 
tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Jesus said to him, friend, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? He said to them, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then he told him a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, I'll do this. I'll pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you've prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves and are not rich toward God. This is the gospel of grace. Thanks be to God. This is a sermon about money. It's not about pledge cards or church budgets or even stewardship, at least not directly. It's about money. So tomorrow, when someone asks you what the preacher preached about, you can say, he preached about money. Uh, and if that person can then respond to you, uh, that's why I stopped going to church, because all they talk about is money. Truth of the matter is, preachers almost never preach about money. They hate to talk about money. Money is the third rail of the ministry. You learn early on, leave it alone. You can talk about sex. You can talk about politics if you're careful. Stay away from money. That's because money is the ultimate taboo topic in America. Now, you wouldn't think so because uh, it's in the news all the time. Stock market is up or down. The Fed has lowered the prime. Federal deficit doubled over this time last year. Lots of jobs have been created, but not enough to satisfy those who, who don't have one. Now, when I say that money is the ultimate taboo topic, I mean I mean, my money, your money. We don't talk about our money to each other. Once when I was still a pastor, I conducted a, uh, an experiment and a sermon. I asked members of the congregation to think about their best friend. Now, picture him or her in their mind. Uh, this is the person, this is the person you called when your marriage was falling apart. This is the person you called when your kid was in trouble. This is the person you call when your mom died. This is the person who knows you better than anybody outside of your family. Picture this person, I said, and, 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 and tell me, how much money does your friend make? The stunned expressions on the faces of members of the congregation said, well, that's, that's none of my business. Why not? Why was it your business when your friend's spouse had an affair? but it's not your business it's how much money they make. What is there about money in our society that makes it such a taboo topic that even best friends don't talk about it to each other? The short answer, of course, is that in our society, money is a measuring stick. It tells you how you're doing compared to other people in your pool. I mean, when we say, I wonder how much he or she is worth, we're talking in monetary terms. And the comparisons start early. At high school reunions, you remember? I recently watched a video uh, of an old Drew Carey routine in which he shared his dread about attending his very first high school reunion. I have, I have six months, he said, to make something of myself. Jesus' attitude toward money is so contrary to our American value system that we who are both American and Christian have to say either he didn't really mean what he said, which is what we usually say in one way or another, or he meant exactly what he said. We just don't want to do it, which I think is more likely the case. For example, give to everyone who asks of you. Luke 630. That's just Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount. Give to everyone who asks of you. Really? On my morning and evening walks downtown, I pass Half a dozen homeless people every day. 
And at least once per walk, someone asks, you got any spare change? And I always say no, because you don't know what they're going to spend it on, right? Which is code for he's probably just going to buy a beer, which, of course, is what a lot of us do at the end of the day. But nevertheless, we're probably doing him a favor, you know, by not giving him any money. It's different with the deserving poor. It's a curious phrase, isn't it? Do we divide any other class of people into deserving and non-deserving? Middle class guy gets fired for being a jerk. We'll give him some help. Get him back on his feet. He doesn't have to be deserving. Poor people, though, lots of rules, lots of regulations. And they have to deserve to be helped. But Jesus, of course, didn't know any of that when he said, give to everyone who asks of you. He probably also was not aware that giving to those who ask of you on the streets is not deductible. Although I do wonder if I could ask a homeless guy for a receipt. Sell all you have and give to the poor, Jesus said. Of course, he didn't have three kids, including one in college and a mortgage. He just basically lived off the grid, didn't he? I mean, he, he didn't have a job. He lived off donations a group of women gave to support his ministry. Jesus told the rich young ruler to sell all he had, give to the poor. It doesn't necessarily apply to us. And, and even if it does, our negotiators got him down to 10%. After taxes, that was a big win for us. And the 10% includes all benevolences, right? Not just the church. And actually, when you think about it, a lot of what we pay in taxes goes to help the poor and needy, right? Well, that should count against the 10%, don't you think? But when you put all that together, it's kind of a wash, really. Carlisle Marnie, the great Baptist preacher of the last generation, said, we're all latent legalists especially where money is concerned. One more. One's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions, said Jesus. Well, maybe not in Nazareth. You see, we can argue with Jesus. We can say he's idealistic. We can say his, uh, his ideas are not practical. We can pretend we didn't hear him. It's harder to ignore people who seem to who seem not to be bound as tightly by our world's values as the rest of us are. People who, who seem to take Jesus more seriously, like Lynn, friend of more than 30 years. Apart from elected office holders, Lynn is the best connected person I know in Winston-Salem. Lynn knows everybody, and everybody knows Lynn. You could do a rewrite of that old joke about the two people who went to Rome on vacation and, and visited the Vatican. And looking across the plaza, one of them said, look, who is that? And the other said, well, I don't know who the guy in the funny hat is, but that's Lynn he's talking to. Lynn's first job out of college was as a political organizer for the National Republican Party. She had an office in the White House. 18 years ago, she co-founded co a nonprofit organization that paid a stipend to teenagers who lived in the projects, as well as some who were rescued from the juvenile justice system. She paid them money to stay off the streets and spend the summer learning to write poetry and rap and lyrics and how to speak publicly and even how to make movies. Graduates of her program usually finished high school. Some go to college, including some of the best art schools in the country. When Lynn Manuel Miranda stepped aside from the role in his lead role in Hamilton last spring, he was replaced by Jimmy Jeter, JJ, as he's known locally. JJ was one of Lynn's kids. Last Thursday night, her organization held its annual fundraiser. JJ zoomed in from his Manhattan apartment and sang songs from Hamilton. I asked a mutual friend to describe Lynn in a word. Gracious, she said. Gracious in every way. Her time, her energy, her attention, her creativity, her imagination, herself. If you're invited to dinner at her house, you will be treated to a lavish meal, and you'll probably meet someone you had only heard or read about. Now, if you're imagining Lynn living in a big house in a posh neighborhood, you're wrong. 
Lynn lives in a small four-room frame house at the end of a dead-end, poorly paved street where every other house on the street is an A-frame rental. Her life, which is extraordinarily rich and full, does not consist in the abundance of her possessions. Her investments are in young lives. Her legacy will be measured in high school diplomas and college degrees. Dreams come true and hope born new. She's found another way to do life. Call it the Jesus way. On many levels, we American Christians struggle with how to be American and Christian. Advocates of the prosperity gospel have stopped struggling. Jesus said you cannot serve God and wealth, and they say, sure you can. In fact, serving God is the way to get wealth. The rest of us squirm when we read what Jesus said about money. We want to take him seriously. Calling him Lord has to mean something, right? So I have a modest proposal, very modest proposal, inspired by Wendell Berry's wonderful poem, Manifesto, The Mad Farmer Liberation Front. The only way to live in this world, he said, without being formed in its image, is to do something every day that doesn't compute, according to the world system of values. Every day, do something that leaves the world scratching its head. For example, he says, love the Lord, love the world, work for nothing, love someone who doesn't deserve it, plant sequoias, be joyful, though you have considered all the facts, practice resurrection. I think if we're going to break the cultural mold that we've all been poured into, we're going to have to do something every day that chips away at that mold. One, one example, one admittedly embarrassing example. Recently, I told my wife that I was tired of coming home from my daily walks, feeling like a failure as a Christian because I didn't help all those who asked of me. So I had decided to put a dollar bill in my shirt pocket and give it to the first person on the street who asked me for spare change. And Nikki said, that's your big conversion? A dollar? And I said, well, but what do you suggest? And she said, make it five. I said, that's, that's $30, $35 a week. And she said, yes, which is what we spend every Friday when you and I go out to lunch. It's small, but it's a start. So following Wendell Berry's lead, I propose. If a guy on the streets ask of thee thy spare change, give unto him $5 just to prove you can do it. And when your favorite charity or congregation comes calling at year's end, determine the absolute most you can afford to give and double it. Wear a t-shirt that says consumerism is the opiate of the people, or one that says I'm going broke, saving money at Costco. Practice generosity. And above all, remember that we serve a Lord who was blown away by the extravagance of a woman who wasted a whole bottle of expensive perfume out of sheer gratitude. And remember that it is in his name that we live. Amen. And now let us go. And as we go, let us remember that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the God of lights, with whom there is no variation, neither shadow of turning. Amen.